Hello and welcome back. In the last video, we talked about Juniper certifications and we also looked at the course outline. In this video, we are going to focus on two important things. Number one is the OSI model and number two is TCP IP model. Let's begin with the OSI model. Before we begin understanding what the OSI model is, it is important to understand why we have something called as the OSI model. To understand this, we need to go back in time into the 1960s and the 1970s when device manufacturers started producing network devices. And each device manufacturer had their own standards and protocols, which means if you went ahead and purchased two network devices from two different vendors, let's say vendor A and vendor B, and you tried to make them talk, this wouldn't happen because there was no common standard or protocol to make them talk. That's when the International Standards Organization, also known as the ISO, came forward to standardize network communication. And they introduced what is known as the OSI model. The OSI model stands for Open Systems Interconnection. It divides your network communication into seven layers. It is important to remember that the OSI model is only a framework that divides your network communication into different layers and each layer has certain protocols, certain functions and certain devices associated with it. Another thing that I'd like to point out is that the OSI model is purely a logical concept. Remember this my friend, it is just a logical concept. There is nothing physical about the OSI model, not even the physical layer. And as I say this, I get remembered of my college days when I studied the OSI model for the first time. And it's, it's kind of funny. I looked at the application layer and thought the application layer actually represents the applications or the softwares that we use on the computer. And the physical layer represents uh, the physical devices of the computer, like your network interface card, and um, your electrical cables and those kind of stuff. And what I thought is these layers in between actually reside somewhere inside my computer. And it took me a long while to realize that this whole concept is logical. And you know who the culprit was for this wrong understanding of mine? This guy right here, the physical layer. It sounds like the physical layer is actually physical, but it's not. So keep that in mind, everything is just a logical concept. Let's begin by looking at the functions of the different layers. The first layer of the OSI model is the physical layer and it is also the bottommost layer of the OSI model. Now every layer of the OSI model has multiple functions associated with it, but it is not important for you to remember all those functions. We will focus on the important functions of every layer. Talking about the physical layer, it has four important functions. Number one is hardware specification. Hardware specification mainly deals with the specifications of your physical equipment like your cables. You have these CAT5 cables, 5E cables, CAT6 cables. It also deals with specifications for your network connectors like your RJ45. You also have fiber connectors. And you also have the pin layout for these connectors. And it also deals with voltage specifications, electrical specifications. So you get an idea, it mainly talks about specifications for those devices, for those equipments that help you connect with the network. The second important function is type of communication. Now there are three types of communication, simplex, half duplex, and full duplex. Now simplex means one-way communication only. You can only send or you can only receive. The best way to understand this is your radio communication. When you tune into your radio, you can only listen to what's being transmitted. You cannot send anything back over those signals. That's a good example of simplex. Half duplex. Now duplex means two-way communication, but half duplex means you can send and you can receive. However, you can do only one at any point of time. A good example of this would be walkie-talkie. Full duplex, on the other hand, means you can send and you can receive both at the same time. A good example is your ordinary phone calls. That's about the type of communication. The other important function of the physical layer is signaling. 
Now signaling means converting your digital data into electrical signals that can be sent over your cables and this whole process is known as let me put that here it is known as encoding there are different ways of encoding one of the techniques that I remember from my college days is Manchester encoding and there's one more called as differential encoding these are techniques that tell you how to convert your digital data your ones and your zeros into electrical signals that can be transmitted over the cables the last important function of the physical layer is your network design now there are many different types of network design the physical layer only talks about the physical topology for example you have the bus topology where you have a common line a common wire and nodes actually tap into this wire that's the bus topology you also have the star topology where you have a node in between and other nodes actually talk through this node that is in between you also have other topologies called as the mesh topology and hybrid topology and and, and, and some more but it's not too important at this point the protocols at the physical layer what are the protocols that operate at your physical layer USB a very common protocol Sonnet OTN optical transport network both of these we are going to talk in the future videos Bluetooth is an important protocol that operates at the physical layer the devices that operate at the physical layer would be your modem your hubs your repeaters your network interface card these are devices that operate at your physical layer. Now, data at the physical layer is in the form of ones, excuse me, ones and zeros in binary format. That's about your physical layer. Let's understand the data link layer. Data link layer is the second layer of the OSI model. It is the layer that mainly deals with your LAN communication and your wireless communications. The data link layer can be divided or subdivided into two layers known as the logical link control and the media access control. So these two are not actually functions, these are actually subdivisions or sub layers of your data link layer. The logical link control mainly deals with multiplexing. So you might have multiple protocols operating in your network, like you may have IP, IPX, Apple Talk. Those protocols are all multiplexed at the logical link control. The logical link control also performs one other important function and that is to maintain the logical links between your communicating devices. So it maintains its logical links. The second sub layer of the data link layer is your media access layer or your MAC layer, your MAC sub layer. Now this layer is, is responsible for media access as the name suggests. Now what do you mean by media access? So let's say multiple devices are trying to access a shared medium. So let me make a fresh diagram here. I'm just going to erase this here. So multiple devices are trying to talk over the same medium. Before they can actually send data over the medium, they need to access this medium. And that access is controlled by the MAC sublayer of the data link layer. The other important function of your data link layer is your physical addressing. Now this is what you call as the MAC address. That's the address that is actually burnt into your device into your chip and that's your real address we are going to spend enough time understanding the physical addressing the MAC addresses flow control is another important function of the data link layer let's understand flow control with an example let me clear the board here so let's say we have two devices device A and device B and device A has the capacity to send 50 frames per second Device B can only receive 30 frames per second. If device A sends data at 50 frames per second, this guy here is going to be overwhelmed with a lot of frames, and that's not good. That's where flow control steps in and reduces the speed at which A is sending data. So it brings down the speed to an optimal rate of 30 frames per second. The other important function is error control. So let's say A is transmitting frames over to B and some of the frames actually get lost or damaged while in transit. Error control makes sure that these frames that are lost in transit or damaged are actually resent. Excuse me, resent. That's what error control does. Now the protocols that operate at the data link layer include your Ethernet, it includes frame relay, it includes 
ATM. It also includes the famous PPP point-to-point -point protocol, HDLC. It also includes token ring. The devices that operate at layer 2 or data link layer are your layer 2 switches and bridges. The data which was in the form of 1s and zeros at the physical layer gets converted into what is known as frames at the data link layer. So you have the physical layer here and you have the data link layer here. So the 1s and zeros here, 1s and zeros get converted into what is known as frames as they reach the data link layer. That's about your data link layer. Let's understand the network layer. The third layer of the OSI model is your network layer. The network layer has three important functions. Number one is IP addressing. IP addresses are logical addresses that are assigned to computers. This is a very important function in terms of network communication. Imagine a world without IP addresses. We could not ever imagine a world without IP addresses. That's how important this function is. But it is not just important to have IP addresses assigned to computers. You also need to be able to route the packets between these IP addresses. And that's where the network layer performs the important function of routing the packets. Sending the packets from one router to another router until it reaches the destination. The last important function of the network layer is fragmentation and reassembly. Now packets that are too large to be sent over the network need to be broken down into smaller pieces before they can be transmitted. Let's understand that with an example. So let's say we have a host here called this host A and we have a host here called this host B and they're communicating to each other with a router in between. Device A has to send a packet that is 3500 bytes in size. But the router here has only the capacity to handle 1500 bytes at any time. That's where fragmentation would come into the picture. As this host A is sending this packet over to the router, the packet would be broken down into smaller fragments of 1,500 bytes each. So you'll have two fragments of 1,500 bytes and the third one would be 500 bytes, making a total of 3,500 bytes. That's what fragmentation means. At the receiving end, all these fragments would be put together to make a single packet. That's what reassembly means. And that important function is actually carried out at the network layer. Talking about the protocols, the protocols that operate at your network layer would include IPv4. It includes IPv6. It also includes ICMP. The devices that operate at your network layer would be your routers, your layer 3 switches, and firewalls. Now the data that was in the form of ones and zeros at the physical layer got converted into frames at your data link layer and these frames get converted into what is known as packets as they reach the network layer. That's about your network layer. Let's understand the transport layer. The transport layer is the fourth layer of the OSI model and it has three important functions. Number one is choosing the transport protocol and that's a very important function. When it comes to the transport layer, an important choice has to be made. You have to select your transport protocol and you have two options. You can select what is known as a connection oriented protocol or you can choose a connection less protocol. Now by the way it sounds, it sounds like the connection oriented protocol is the better one. But that's not always correct. It's an important decision that you have to make considering the traffic that you're sending. Now what does connection oriented mean? Connection oriented communication means that when we send data from one device to another device, the other device that receives this data has to send an acknowledgement to the sending device that it actually got the data. If this acknowledgement does not arrive, this data is again resent. That's what a connection oriented protocol means. Now that sounds very good for something like FTP. So if we are transmitting data, we want to make sure all the data got transmitted successfully. And it's good to have a connection oriented protocol. But what about connection less protocol? Some types of communication do not need to be transmitted in a connection oriented manner. For example, audio and video. 
or let's put it as real-time audio and video. To understand this, let's think of a hypothetical example. So I have a user here, is user A, and I have a user here who's user B, and he's trying to talk to this user over a connection-oriented protocol. And this guy here only sends three words over to the other side. How are you? Now, assuming this is a connection-oriented protocol, as this data is being transmitted, as, this th as these three words are being transmitted, the first word and the second word actually get through, and this word actually does not get through, this guy will not be sending an acknowledgement for the word R. So once these two words, how and you, are received, A is again going to send this word back, R. And this is how we actually you would get that communication. Now this is a hypothetical example for you to understand in a simple manner. That's why you don't need connection-oriented protocol for real-time communication like audio and video. Connection-less protocols are just fine. Connection-oriented protocol would mean TCP, Transmission Control Protocol. An example of connection-less protocol would be UDP, User Datagram Protocol. That's how important this decision of choosing your transport protocol is. Let's try to understand process separation. So you have this computer here, and your computer's IP address is 1.1.1.1. And your computer is actually talking to a web server, which is at 2.2.2.2 over port 80. And it is also talking to an FTP server, which is at 3.3.3.3 over port 21. For the HTTP connection, you are using a web browser on your computer. And for the FTP connection, you are using an FTP client. Now, when the web server replies to your original request, how is it that this data, this web data, does not get transferred to the FTP client? And when the FTP server actually sends FTP data, how is it that this data does not go into your web browser? That's where process separation plays a very important role. Process separation happens with the help of port numbers. So, when your computer is sending data to the web server, it selects a source port number. Let's say it is 50,000. So 1.1.1.1 .1 .1 over port 50,000 is talking to 2.2.2.2 .2 over port 80. And let's say 1.1.1.1 .1 over port 60,000 is talking to this FTP client or FTP server at 3.3.3.3 over port 21. So when the web server sends the return data, it actually goes to the port number 50,000, which belongs to your web browser, and the FTP data goes back to the port number 60,000, which belongs to your FTP client. That's how process separation is achieved on your computer, and that's a function of the transport layer. Segmentation and reassembly. So let's go back to the OSI model for a second here. So you have this OSI model here. The physical layer had the ones and zeros, which got converted into frames as it moved to the data link layer, which again got converted into your packets as it moved to the network layer. These packets, when they move to the transport layer, they get converted into what is known as segments. Segmentation and reassembly. This is very similar to fragmentation and reassembly that we saw at the network layer. Just like the network layer that breaks down the packets into smaller fragments, the transport layer breaks down the packets or the data into smaller segments. These are then reassembled at the receiving end to get your original data. That's what segmentation and reassembly does. The protocols that operate at your transport layer include TCP, UDP, SSL, which is the secure socket layer, authentication header, and some other similar protocols. That's about your transport layer. Let's look at the session layer. We'll look at the session layer and the presentation layer together. The session layer is the fifth layer of the OSI model, and the presentation layer is the sixth layer of the OSI model. The session layer, there's really not much to it. There's two important functions that it does. Number one is session establishment. So it manages the sessions between your communicating parties. That's what session establishment means. It, it manages, it opens the sessions, it controls the sessions, and terminates those sessions between the communicating parties. The other important function that the session layer performs is synchronization. So when these two parties are talking, in case of errors, in case of communication mismatch, the session layer synchronizes the communication between these two parties using sequence numbers. 
That's what synchronization means. And those are the two important functions of the session layer. Some of the protocols that operate at your session layer that would include your NetBIOS. It's a very popular protocol on Windows. It also has SOX. SOX is a protocol that operates at your session layer. Network File System, NFS. It also operates at your session layer. Talking about the presentation layer, like we discussed, it is the sixth layer of your OSI model and it performs three important functions. Number one is presentation itself, which can also be called as formatting. So as the data comes up from the bottom layers of the OSI model, this data is in generic format. And the presentation layer converts this data from your generic format into well-known formats. Well-known formats. Well-known formats could be MP3. It could be JPG. That's the most important function of the presentation layer, to convert your data into well-known formats, to present your data. Another important function of the presentation layer is encryption. Encryption is performed using two protocols. Number one is TLS and the other one is SSL. TLS stands for Transport Layer Security and SSL stands for Secure Sockets Layer. These are the two protocols that are used for encryption to secure your data at the presentation layer. The presentation layer also performs compression to reduce the number of bits that would be required to transmit the data. That's about your session layer and presentation layer. Let's look at application layer. Like we talked in the beginning, the application layer does not represent the applications on your computer. Don't get confused. The application layer only provides protocols or services that allow the applications to interface with the OSI model. That's what the application layer does. It does not mean your applications. Remember this, it is a very important thing, my friend. Some of the very well-known protocols operate at your application layer. Protocols like HTTP, SMTP, FTP, DHCP, DNS. These are some of the well-known protocols that operate at your application layer. That's about the seven layers of the OSI model. Let's look at the TCP IP model, which is slightly different from what your OSI model is. The one on the left is the OSI model, and the one on the right is the TCP IP model. The TCP IP model was developed by the Department of Defense, and it is pretty similar to the OSI model. The major difference is that the OSI model has seven layers, but the TCP IP model only has four layers. The first three layers of the OSI model are combined to form what is known as the application layer in the TCP IP model. The transport layer remains as the transport layer. The network layer is known as the internet layer. And the last two layers, the data link layer and the physical layer of the OSI model are called as the network access layer That's how the OSI model compares with the TCP IP model. I know this has been a very long video, but the good thing is that we covered a lot of important topics. We gained a lot of information. In the next video, we are going to start by looking at layer two concepts. So let me put that here. We'll look at layer two concepts. We'll look at ethernet in specific. We'll look at VLANs. We'll look at MAC addresses and some other layer two concepts it's going to be really interesting. I'd like to thank you for watching.